Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the BBGI Global Infrastructure Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just please simply type in your questions at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll, and if you give that your kind attention, the company would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand over to Frank Sharam, CEO from BBGI. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, also welcome and um, um, good afternoon to everyone on the on the webcast. Uh, thanks for your interest in BBGI and um, welcome uh, to our 20, 2021 annual results presentation. I will start the presentation and. Uh, walk you through till about middle, and then I hand over to Duncan. Um, we'll start the presentation on page five. That slide actually presents the fundamentals or the DNA of BBGI and its investment proposition here, who we are. We are a global responsible infrastructure investor with a low risk investment strategy, and we focus on delivering long-term attractive and sustainable returns. And how do we do that? Our business model is based on four pillars, low risk, globally diversified, a strong ESG approach, and internally managed. Starting with low risk, what does it mean? We only invest in availability-based uh, investments. That means basically PPP investments, and, and therefore the revenues are coming from public sector or public sector-backed counterparties, um, and that actually gives us stable and predictable cash flows coming from our underlying investments. And then it allows us to also do progressive, progressive long-term dividends. Um, the second pillar is globally diversified. Um, we're investing in triple A or double rated countries, which provide a stable, well-developed operating environment. And uh, although we have got a global portfolio that serves, serves local communities. The third pillar is our strong ESG approach. ESG is fully integrated into our business model. That means into asset management, into risk management, into investment decisions, here, into corporate governance. Here, and uh, that has been, we have been doing that for the last couple of years. Here, and I think uh, that has worked quite successfully. And Duncan will provide a good overview over our ESG, ESG activities in the second part of the presentations. We focus on delivering social impact uh, with our portfolio. And on the other hand, we have also, um, we can also demonstrate, have also demonstrated that our um, portfolio shows a high degree of climate resilience, given that we have done an extensive modeling exercise. The, exec the executive compensation and, uh, and, uh, and also the senior people in our, in our team, you know, all, you know, all these actually are linked, they're linked actually, they are variable compensations also linked to ESG performance. We internally managed, and um, that's that's quite quite unique feature here. So that means Duncan um, and the whole team and I are employed by the company itself. We're not an asset manager, not an external asset manager, and that gives a full alignment of interests with our shareholders. Um, we take shareholder first, of first and portfolio growth second. We are we actually are remunerated and also um, incentivized by the same metric than our shareholders are which is actually total share return and NEV per share growth. And more important to note, not portfolio growth. The quantitative benefit of that is that we're offering a very competitive low, low ongoing charge. Moving now to page number seven, uh, this presents the financial highlights for the year 2021. The NEV has grown by 9.4% to over a billion. Um, <clears throat> more importantly, the NEV per share has grown by 2.1% to 140.7 pence per share. And uh, as for the last 10 years, also in 2021, we achieved our dividend target of 7.33 pence per share. Uh, we reconfirm our 2022 and 2022 three dividend targets. And please also to set a new dividend target for 2024 of 7.4, 7.78 pence per share. The introduction of this new 2022 dividend target, that should also demonstrate that uh, we have got strong confidence in our business model and what we also call you know, arguably boring but attractive and reliable business model. Dividend cover was strong at 1.31 and uh, our annualized shareholder return is 10.4, which, which is well above the IRR target, which we have set at the IPO of 7 to 8 percent. The ongoing charge is due to our internal management structure very competitive and is at 0.86. And the five-year better was at 0.25. And that demonstrates that our shares is largely uncorrelated 
to the wider equity market that may be attractive, especially in this time of volatility and uncertainty. <coughs> Moving on to page eight. Um, that slide presents our robust operating model. Our model is based on three business principles, starting with value driven active management. We have a total 54 assets, availability-based assets in our portfolio, and the performance was strong. Um, cash receipts were again ahead of expectations. And there's also no distribution lockup or defaults uh, in our portfolio. What does it mean? The underlying investments, there's no covenant breaches on the credit facilities. That means we can, we can get the money on the distributions which we have planned, we can get it out of our companies without any restrictions. Active asset management activities contributed strongly to on 1.4%. Yeah, and um, we also delivered a high uh, availability level of our assets to our public sector counterparties of 99.9%. And that means we make the asset available yeah, to, our, to our public sectors and, our, uh, and the communities at this level. There's a very little unavailability, which, the, which actually the hospital, the schools, or whatever it is, was not available to the public sector. Um, we also initiated and uh, followed through a broad range of ESG initiatives, and Duncan will talk more about that. Room financial management is the second pillar. Um, we got a net cash position of 26.9 million, and no cash borrowing is outstanding. Um, we have delivered since the IPO a progressive dividend growth of 3.3% here, and renewed and expanded our five year uh, credit facility to one more year, and also 230 million. And uh, last year, we were supported. Um, and had a significantly oversubscribed uh, capital raise of, 20, of 75 million. Yeah, and uh, our portfolio comes also with an attractive inflation linkage of 44 basis points. Selective acquisition strategy is our third operational pillar. Uh, as mentioned, we focus on availability based only. There's no shift into higher risk asset classes, such as toll roads or actually regulated assets, yeah, which all suffered during the pandemic or through regulatory injections. Um, we did 79 million of uh, new investments, you know, four new investments. And uh, um, post in February, we had our first investment in our, the clean energy sector of 24 million. And that all helped to further diversify our social impact portfolio. Moving on to page number nine. Uh, that slide presents the dividend track record and the protected cash flows from our portfolio. Um, the top chart shows the yearly increase over the last 10 years which averaged 3.3%. At IPO, we promised a progressive dividend and we delivered on that promise. We also set dividend target for 2022 to 2024 and uh, said we are always today delivered on our targets. The chart at the bottom presents our long-term stable and predictable cash flow profile coming from our portfolio. And the green part of the columns show actually the cash flows from our additional four investments, uh, which we uh, did last year, which we acquired last year. And as you can see, the new assets provide equally stable and long-term cash flow. As a general reminder, the cash flows come from public sector or public sector counterparty, and that obviously helps to have got a long-term predictable cash flow profile. Moving on to page number 10. <coughs> um, that slide presents our track record. The top chart presents the total NAV and dividend per share growth. Over the last 10 years, we delivered a continuous growth of both the NEV and the dividends. Um, the accumulated NEV and dividends per share add up to 201.2. Uh, we never had a year of negative NEV growth. It also shows that on average, each year dividend and NEV growth were about 10 pence. Looking back last five years, um, it always worked like a clockwork. We delivered an increase from 150, around 60, 70, 80, 90, and 201. Um, on the right-hand side, you see a couple of return matrix, like an NEV return um, of total NEV return of 133%, the annualized total share and NEV return of 7.4. Um, we're trading on a, what we believe attractive and also reliable dividend yield of around 4.3%, yeah, and the total share return over the last 10 years was 171.1%. Moving on to page 11. That slide presents actually the last 10 years and what we delivered in terms of NEV and what were the key driver of our NEV performance. Um, so the NEV was strong over the last 10 years and have grown by 43 pence per share, yeah, from 97.9 to 140.7. The largest element, which we are really proud of as BBGI, is um, the, the uh, value creative enhancements of 28.8% 
almost 30% uh, in EV increase. And that is the contribution of the value add of the BBGI team, which we delivered to our shareholders over the last 10 years. This includes actually a creative refinancing, managing change orders where we get a fee for that, cost savings on insurances or management service agreements, managing life cycle, and many other initiatives. Um, the second point to note here is the impact resulting from the reduction in the market discount rate. Uh, which added 17.2 pence per share. However, if you look at the next column, the change in macro macroeconomic assumptions, this was to a large extent actually offset by a reduction in our deposit rates. The underlying investments, a lot of them have got actually they have got cash, and uh, we assumed that we would earn um, a decent deposit rate on that one interest, but that has reduced significantly. It's in most cases now close to zero. Yeah, so, so, so we suffered actually uh, valuation loss here that was offsetting actually the change in market discount rate. On the other hand, it means in case there were rising significantly rising interest rates, yeah, we would also expect that uh, the macroeconomic assumptions we would get back actually deposit rates and earn interest, yeah, and also um, that would offset any potential uh, loss on the market discount rate changes. The third point to note here is that we benefit from a global portfolio. And the flip side is we're exposed to foreign volatility, foreign exchange volatility. Uh, we have about two thirds of our portfolio outside the sterling, but due to our very effective hedging strategy, yeah, um, the effect was only minor. And the overall effect over 10 years, the net effect was 2.6 pence per share. Moving on to page 12. Um, <laughs> this slide presents four key strengths of the portfolio. On the top, you see two boring, but what believe important facts. We invested 100% in availability-based PPP assets, no exposure to other higher risk asset classes. Secondly, more, more than 99% of our portfolio in terms of values operational, yeah, with minimal construction exposure. On the bottom left, you see that we are truly global. Yeah, we currently have 36% of our portfolio in Canada. UK is the second largest uh, geography with 33%. Yeah, followed by Australia, US, and continental Europe, all around 10%. All assets are located in triple A or double A rated countries. The chart on the bottom right demonstrates our social impact with a diversified sector exposure in healthcare, blue light, and correctional facilities, education, affordable housing, and also transport. Moving on to page 13. Uh, in terms of concentration risk, on the top, le on the top left, you, you see the top five assets represent 35% of the portfolio and the next five, 70%. So the portfolio is well diversified with no major single asset exposure. In the middle, you see our diversified supply chain partners, and that demonstrates that we don't have any undue concentration risk to any subcontractor. The investment life, uh, um, that's still quite long. 61% you know, of the portfolio have a concession length of more than 20 years left. Yeah, and the average portfolio life is 20.3 years, and average debt maturity is 17.3. Looking now at page 15, um, which presents our active asset management approach, um, we take a very hands-on approach, and we take that seriously. And uh, we're looking both to preserve value on the one hand, while also we're working to identify opportunities wherever we can to enhance the values. And our focus is to deliver well-maintained infrastructures for communities and end users, users and stable, predictable returns for the shareholders. Yeah, and to achieve this, we've got a strong governance structure in place. And we also try to maintain our good relationships with our public sector counterparties and clients. We, we, we really endeavor to meet our clients regularly. And the motto is, yeah, you need to have got a coffee with your client when there's no issue because you don't get a coffee when there's an issue. So it's important that we stay close to our clients, that we understand if there are concerns here when there's still maybe some, 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 some crowd noises only, that we address them early. Yeah, to achieve this during the pandemic, we obviously couldn't meet everyone in person, so we used video conferences where, and where there's no possible calls. But now we're getting back to normal yeah, or more normal that we're trying actually to contact again and, and make physical meetings with all our clients. Um, the focus last year during the pandemic was still on value preservation. You know, we have got a rigorous subcontractor monitoring and contingency planning in place. And then touch wood, um, every, every of our sub, one of our subcontractors performed well. There was no actually material issue in any of our service deliveries. You know, and that is also high, really thankful to all the hard work of all the hard, of all the people actually on the ground of our FM contractors and operational maintenance contractors. Um, 
Also last year, our active asset management approach contributed strongly to the NAV increase by about 13 million. And that is the net effect of uh, refinancings, change orders, you know, cost savings. You know, and, um, and that was a strong contribution from the whole team. Moving on to page 16 and 17. Um, 16 and 17, um, that actually showcases proof on new investments. And I, I will present the Aberdeen Western Bypass Road. Um, in August 21, we acquired 33%. Um, in this PPP project here, yeah, uh, where 12 kilometers of roads were upgraded and 47 kilometers were new built. Yeah, and the final section of the road was opened, or it was opened in stages in 2016 and the final section in 2019. There's a long concession left until 2047. Uh, availability payments are received by the Scottish ministers. ministers um, and we, we bought that project as part of the portfolio of three availability-based assets from Belfort BT. Um, and that shows also that we got uh, quite good connections within the industry. It was a first deal with Belfort BT here, and we got actually relationships with key contractors in all the jurisdictions we are actually active. Um, the project has got strong um, ESG, uh, environmental and social stewardship uh, credentials. And if I only pick one here, here um, the, 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 the congestion actually in Aberdeen reduced significantly. Yeah, and the HGV traffic on local routes also reduced from 27 minutes to 10 minutes. Yeah, so that actually helps, obviously, to re also improve the air quality for over 75,000 homes. Um, I end here, and the hand over to Duncan will actually lead, lead through the second part of the presentation. Okay, th thanks, Frank. Um, this slide shows uh, an acquisition we did in February. Uh, it's our first clean energy acquisition. It's called the John Hart Generating Station. And it is um, a power project on Vancouver Island in Canada. What's unique about this is we receive availability payments. So we're not, um, it, it's not like your typical power project where you're taking hydrology risk or power price demand risk or uh, anything of that sort. This is very much in line with our strategy of receiving availability payments. The availability payments come from um, a crown corporation, which is part of the BC government. It's, it's called BC Hydro. And so it's a very uh, stable offtake that's, that's paying us as long as uh, uh, we allow water to pass through and the turbines turn, we get paid irrespective of how much power is generated. Um, again, with an uh, ongoing theme with all our, uh, all our projects is the strong ESG approach. And this one, we're particularly proud of the fact that it's generating uh, clean, renewable power for 80,000 homes on Vancouver Island. There was a lot of uh, consideration put into preserving fish habitat when the project was done. And there was an old uh, pen stock where uh, the old materials were removed and there was cons considerable reforestation done. And um, so, so there's lo lots of consideration for ESG with this project. Um, if, if I turn to the, the, this slide, it showcases how we look at ESG in our portfolio. So we look at uh, it through the lens of the UN SDGs, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and really at the core uh, of, of our business model is, is uh, SDG 9, which is uh, innovating uh, and sustainable infrastructure. As you go around the, 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 our portfolio, you'll see we have uh, 41 essential healthcare projects. Those help deliver uh, health and well-being. Our 33 schools help support quality education. Um, our 18 transportation projects, including one green, uh, fully electric public transit system, help make, sustainable, uh, make communities sustainable. They help reduce transit times, travel times for over three. 300 million vehicles a year. And then um, also our uh, police stations and our uh, modern correction facilities help support peace, justice, and strong institutions. One SDG that we've started to track this year is, is number 13, which is climate action. And uh, I will talk on the following slides about all, all the work we're doing on, uh, to understand climate change and its impacts on our portfolio. Uh, we did a lot of this year on uh, on the ESG and, and responsible in investing. We are about to produce a standalone 66-page ESG report, which will be out shortly. So I encourage anyone who's interested in that to go to our website. We had a, a, a full document last year, but this is 
e even more comprehensive uh, this year. And I'll just touch on some of the highlights uh, that, that, that occurred within our portfolio and amongst our team this year. So we, we did our second year of voluntary disclosure against the full uh, set of questions for the task force for climate related financial disclosure. Uh, as part of that exercise, we undertook a comprehensive climate modeling. So we looked at eight different perils uh, under three different climate scenarios under multiple time horizons. This is for all 54 of our assets. The conclusion by the climate scientists that did this work for us is there is a high degree of climate resilience within our portfolio. So we're, uh, again, uh, sort of highlighting the low risk nature of our portfolio. Not only we paid by stable, predictable counterparties, but we now can put our hand in our heart and say that we're, we're very confident that we'll perform in um, different climate environments and will not be subject to climate change um, considerations. <clears throat> Um, we report our corporate scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Uh, we had those independently verified, and we can uh, say that we're carbon neutral for 2021. We've purchased offsets. Obviously, what we want to do uh, in the future is reduce our carbon footprint. So we will uh, continue to look to ways to reduce our carbon footprint and uh, use offsets. As a, as a, but we've, we've set aggressive goals to reduce our carbon footprint. There was new legislation came out this year called SFDR, uh, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulations. Um, we consider ourselves an Article 8 firm or product uh, because our investments del deliver social benefits. So uh, we're aligned with the SFDR requirements uh, as they sit now. There's uh, a number of uh, voluntary and mandatory uh, reporting metrics that will come into play next year. Uh, in order to address that, we've really amped up our uh, reporting at the asset management level. We used to have a questionnaire that was 23 points. It's now been expanded to 80, over 80, uh, 82 points uh, or 82 questions. And that will give us the data to be able to meet uh, the SFDR disclosure requirements. Um, we uh, became a signatory to the Net Zero uh, Asset Managers Initiative last year, and um, we've set ambitious targets, and those are detailed both in our annual report and in our uh, ESG report. And then finally, um, we, we do follow a series of frameworks. We are a uh, signatory to the Principles of Responsible Investment. We're a signatory to the UN Global Compact, a TCFD supporter, and 50 form of uh, sustainability certification. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the NAV movement during the period. So we started the year at 916 million uh, NAV. We concluded the year at over a billion. So that was a nice threshold. Really, the uh, probably the most interesting aspects are the, uh, the areas in the middle here where we uh, show what happened within the portfolio. So um, the, we, we benefited from uh, declining discount rates. So uh, that contributed uh, 1.6. But as Frank mentioned earlier, often when there's declining discount rates, it's because of lower interest rates. And so we suffer a little bit on the macroeconomic assumptions. So you can see we, we gave back a little bit there as well. Um, but we, we contributed 13.1 uh, million or 1.4% of the NAV increase per share was attributable to uh, active asset management. So that's something we're very proud of. And that's all the initiatives we do at the portfolio company levels, whether it's uh, insurance savings, uh, refinancings, change orders, uh, just, just tr trying to get more from the orange just being more uh, aggressive in terms of how we manage these and uh, uh, be really engaged in the day-to-day -day, uh, management of the as uh, activities at the project company level. This slide talks about the discount rates that we use to value the portfolio and, and uh, our approach to valuation. We uh, come up with a valuation that's independently verified uh, by an external uh, uh, valuation expert and then that is in turn reviewed by our auditors uh, and they opine on it. And both the independent expert and the auditors uh, have opined that our uh, valuation is conservative and prudent. So uh, that, that should give you some comfort. Um, the portfolio discount rate is 6.55 across the entire portfolio. 
one of the questions we often get uh, these days is what how do you think uh, your portfolio valuation will will hold up in the face of uh, if, if interest rates start to back up but what you can see here is in this slide is that the uh, the, the, the dark blue and the light blue together create the portfolio discount rate. And you can see that that has come down over the last decade. Um, but the pickup over the risk-free rate, uh, the, the dark blue being the risk-free rate has, has grown over time. Um, it, it was much smaller back in say 2007. Uh, it's quite healthy now at, at in over 5% especially when you figure we're getting paid by AA and AAA rated entities typically um, to have a nice pickup like that over the risk-free rate. We think that um, interest rates could back up a little bit before we see any change in, in uh, market observed discount rates. Uh, the other thing uh, I would add to that is as we participate in the secondary market, buying assets or trying to buy assets, We've seen no change in uh, the market's view towards these assets. It, it's not like they're uh, pricing them differently uh, based on recent activity with, with interest rates. So it, it re remains very healthy demand, a demand outstrips supply, and that's why the discount rates have stayed low. Um, this slide shows some of the sensitivities that we, we typically showcase. Two sensitivities that are... Uh, particularly important and new uh, that we wanted to show uh, in, in, in light of the current market conditions is one uh, about inflation and one about discount rates. So regarding, regarding inflation rates, um, we, 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 on all our assets, we get inflation protection through the contracts. It varies by contract, but we, we have strong in, in inflation linkage. So you can see that if interest or inflation rates rather were 100 basis points higher than our expectation, that would contribute uh, to a 3.9% uplift in NAV. Um, we, we have not changed our long-term inflation assumption because it is a, a very much a long-term inflation assumption. So we, we take a, a view that uh, uh, the one or two periods of higher inflation shouldn't, shouldn't cause us to uh, revisit our 20 year or 30 year views. But we have shown here uh, a short term inflation sensitivity. So we've said if, if short term inflation rates for the next two years were 5% for each of 2022 and 2023, you can see that that would uh, deliver a 2.6% increase in NAV. And then uh, finally, the, the, the other sensitivity I think is important is historically we've shown what happens if there's a 100 basis point increase or decrease in discount rates. Uh, that, that's the first sensitivity at the top of the page, and you can see it's quite large. But in reality, it, it's, we, we, we don't think you're going to see just a, 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 a change in discount rates alone. Discount rates are going to be uh, a derivative of other changes in the market. So you're, you're typically going to have a change in discount rates when you have higher inflation, higher deposit rates, that, 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 that then in turn creates higher discount rates. So we've shown a sensitivity where 100 basis point increase in inflation, deposit rates and discount rates, um, uh, that impact is much less than just 100 basis point change. You know, it's, it's about a 2.3% uh, reduction in NAV versus almost an 8% reduction in NAV. So you can see this, this sort of ties back to the, the, the comment I made on the earlier slide is that um, we think you can have some fundamental changes in interest rate without having a, a lot of pressure on the portfolio valuation. Uh, moving ahead, we wanted to just touch briefly on risk management. We, we maintain a very robust risk register across the portfolio. We're tracking far more risks than this, but these are just some of the topical risks that people uh, seem to be asking about in the current environment. You know, we've talked about inflation and, and, and what it means. Um, we, we're, we're proud of the fact that we have strong inflation correlation. It's 44 basis points. So that means that if inflation were 100 basis points higher than expectation, the company's returns would go up 44 basis points from 6.55 to 6.99, so almost 7% uh, based on our target discount rate. We monitor our supply chain uh, rigorously. We have a diversified supply chain and we have policies and procedures uh, which greatly reduce that risk. 
Um, so it is something we monitor, but there's nothing that uh, causes us great concern at the current time. Um, we, we often get asked questions, are, uh, how impacted is your supply chain to inflationary pressures? Uh, the, the, the comment there is that we, we get inflation and we uh, protection from our clients through these uh, project agreements, and then that gets passed on to the uh, supply chain as well. So they, they have some inflation protection as well. So it's not causing us great, great concern. Sustainability, we, we have done uh, a deep dive to, to look at sustainability risk within our portfolio. We've done climate change modeling this year, and we can put our hand on our heart and say that we're, we're confident that the portfolio will perform uh, in different climate environments, and, and we're not uh, particularly worried about stranded asset risks or, or concerns of that regard. And then finally on this slide, cyber risk. Cyber risk is a, a, a concern. Um, we have cyber policies uh, at the corporate level. When we started working from home during COVID, uh, we, we increased our training and our, and our penetration testing and, and did all the appropriate things there. Um, we have also looked at the various project companies and, and made sure that they have uh, cyber policies in place. But the, but the real uh, comfort level we get is that we're not maintaining a lot of information uh, or systems. Uh, those are typically maintained by the client. So you can imagine in a healthcare uh, setting like a, a hospital, we're not keeping client records or patient information. That is the health health authority or NHS uh, trust that's that's maintaining that information. And our points of interface with the client system are very limited. You know where we do have IT systems. It's usually maintained by one of our FM providers, and it's it, it can be the building systems, and those usually uh, are are have some some form of manual override. So if the lifts or elevators were hacked, there's an ability to to come in and and manually operate them and and take the system offline and correct it. So so we have done that at level of analysis, and we're we're comfortable that um, cyber risk is re relatively low within our portfolio. Um. Just wanted to highlight again, Frank touched on it in the early part of the presentation, but just the internal management. We think this is a, a real benefit for a number of reasons. One is obviously the ongoing charge is very low, uh, 86 basis points, but probably equally important is the alignment of interest it creates. Um, Frank, myself, the rest of the team, we're, we're motivated by the exact same things that shareholders are, which is uh, NAV per share growth, sustainable dividends, uh, dividend growth. We're not interested in acquiring assets to earn fees. There's no external manager that's paid a fee. We work for the company. We don't have any competing mandates. So when we look at an acquisition, we're, we're looking at it and saying, does if we buy this new asset, does it make our overall portfolio better? Does it give diversification benefits? Does it give financial uplift? And that, those are the, the, the driving criteria. So what it's done is it's incentivized us to grow, but it's been disciplined growth where we haven't grown for growth's sake. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about our pipeline. One of the questions we get is, you know, how, you know are you going to continue to deploy capital? What's the environment you're, you're investing? Uh, the, the, the quick answer is we see a strong pipeline of opportunities. It is a fairly uh, niche sector, so uh, it, 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 we're, we're not seeing, we're seeing strong demand for these assets because they've demonstrated their uh, resiliency in a, in, in, during the pandemic and in, 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 in uh, uncertain times. The fact that we're paid by stable, predictable governments is an attractive feature that has caused a lot of uh, participants to be very interested in the assets. So there, there's strong demand for these assets, but we've, um, been able to secure opportunities and remain uh, disciplined in our pricing. We have a, a pipeline agreement with uh, a North American engineering and construction firm. That was how we got the John Hart generating station this year. Uh, we have four more opportunities that come from that uh, that, that will may, may, may surface in coming years. These are opportunities, not obligations. Uh, so we, we have no obligation to acquire these opportunities that come through this pipeline. We also have uh, a, a number of uh, opportunities where we, we're talking to contractors uh, that have developed these types of assets and want to monetize them. But a lot of that we 
intent because we signed NDAs uh, as part of a process. But suffice it to say, there's there's an attractive pipeline of opportunities, but as always, we'll remain disciplined and we're not going to grow for growth's sake. Um, we continue to do primary bidding. Um, and the fact that we're in different markets means that if it slows down in one market, it may pick up in another. We're currently shortlisted on a, a European uh, in, a transportation project and, uh, you know, we're working well in there. So suffice to say, there's uh, sufficient opportunities for us to continue to grow the portfolio in a, in a disciplined manner. So just to conclude, um, it's been another strong year of results for us. We're very happy uh, with the performance of the portfolio. It's critical social infrastructure. So it's schools, hospitals, blue light, justice, affordable housing. It's all availability based. It's strong government counterparties that are paying us. Um, we can now uh, say that we've done the climate modeling work and it's, it's not only low risk uh, from a financial perspective, but also from a, a climate change perspective. So we're, we're confident there. Uh, the, uh, Portfolio continues to perform well. There's nothing that uh, fundamentally keeps Frank and I up at, uh, at night or, or is concerning to us. So we'll continue to prudently manage the portfolio. Uh, we'll continue to integrate ESG into our approach. Uh, that, that will be a thematic uh, continuation. The uh, portfolio has low correlation to other asset classes and, and in this environment that seems very attractive. It has good inflation linkage and, you know, uh, as, as we move to the future, uh, we remain optimistic that we can grow the portfolio in a, in a disciplined and con contained manner and that there's opportunities uh, to diversify the portfolio and, 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 and make, it, make it stronger. So on that, I'll, I'll just stop and um, open it up for questions. Um, That's great. Duncan, Frank, thank you very much indeed for updating investors this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. But as well, Duncan and Frank take a few moments to review those questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you that the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and we'll notify you by email when they're ready for your review. Um, Duncan, Frank, uh, investors have submitted a number of questions, and I think also a number of questions uh, that were submitted during the uh, presentation. I think you've actually addressed uh, through it and I think they've just take, been taken off of the panel. Uh, so I guess those are the questions there, if you'd be so kind. If I could ask you to read out the questions and just give a response and then I'll pick up from you at the end. Maybe I'll take the first two, which uh, questions from Mark. Um, it's asking about the demand for infrastructure and whether we would consider any new geographies. Um, I think the, the, the reality is the demand for this asset class is very strong. Um, I think there's a lot of parties that would be very interested in, in having more exposure to this sector, but it can be a hard sector to get exposure to if you're not a specialist in this sector. There's a certain mode around the business in that some of the, you know, compared to what a, a large, say, pension fund might want to deploy, a lot of these individual assets are smaller. So that, that gives us a bit of protect, protection. So uh, we're not worried about threats of new entrants coming in and uh, overwhelming the market, but there is a very healthy demand for this type of product because it's performed so well. So, so that's hopefully addressing the first bit. The second part of the, or like the question was geographies. Um, I think we're, we're, we're very comfortable with where we are, uh, AA and AAA rated countries. We're in uh, Australia. Maybe maybe we could look at some things in New Zealand. Uh, we're in Europe, uh, Northern Europe. I think we will stay in the stronger credit rated countries in Northern Europe. But, um, uh, you know, so you might see some uh, uh, new geographies in Northern Europe, but um, we're, we're not looking at material changes to our to our strategy. So, uh, you know, we have a, a, a assets in Germany and the Netherlands. We might look at Benelux. Uh, we have assets in Norway. So we might we might fill in around the edges, but you're not going to see us going to um, uh, you know, different continents or uh, uh, significantly different credit ratings countries. I have to go on mute. Sorry, thank you. Um, if I take the other one, actually, what's what is our um, policy or share buybacks? Um, share buybacks are 
and put it that way, we're in a luxury situation that we never had to consider share buybacks. You're doing that typically when you're trading on a discount to NAV. And if you look at our um, our premium, we have constantly traded at premium over the last couple of years. We are also constantly trading of a premium of around 20 plus percent or 21 plus percent. Um, we would consider that if in case we were trading at an NEV discount, you know, would do that and would trade that uh, for foreseeable future, you know, to actually help help actually the share price performance. Um, we have got an AGM um, vote on that every year. You know, now 14.99%, we get actually the right to do it. But as I said, so far, there was no need to even get, even get near to that considering that one. Um, Next question is from Simon. Um, how big is the BBGI team? Uh, we are a team of around 25 to 30 people. Yeah, we started off with around 10 people and have grown over time uh, to, to the level. Um, <coughs> we're comfortable with that level. Yeah, we got some redundancy therein. Yeah, and also we've got an evaluation team in the acquisition team, the asset management team. Um, and so far it worked out quite well. And, um, and it shows that even with, with, that, with that team number, we, we can deliver a very competitive ongoing charge and feel comfortable with our capabilities and resources we have at hand. That's great, Frank. Duncan, thank you very much. I think you've taken those questions uh, that we've had in from investors during today's call. And of course, if, if any further questions do make themselves visible to us, we'll present those to you after today's meeting. Um, now, I know investor feedback is particularly important to you both and to the company, and I'll shortly redirect the attendees on the call to give you their thoughts and expectations. But before doing so, I wondered if I may just ask you for a few closing comments. If I may, either one, I, I, I don't mind. Just to, just to wrap up with, as I say, I'll, I'll redirect investors to give you their thoughts shortly afterwards. Sure. sure. Um, I think, we, I think w w if, you, if you go back to the slide of conclusion, actually, yes, exactly. Uh, there, I think in the changing times, we, we really are confident or, um, of our low risk, risk resilient portfolio here. Yeah? And uh, the volatility in the market, actually, um, we're providing a defensive stock here, you know, if you look at that. Yeah, we are hybrid um, between actually probably a real equity and a bond, you know, and, uh, um, and that served us very well. You know, and it has shown that we are largely uncorrelated to wide equity margin markets. We provide critical social infrastructure. You know, um, we have 100% availability based. We get our revenues from our strong government counterparties. We've got a climate resilient portfolio and we've got an attractive inflation linkage here. You know? So I think we're well placed in the current market yeah, and hopefully attractive to the investors and continue to be attractive to investors. That's great. Well, thank you very much indeed to both Frank and to Duncan for updating investors this afternoon. Um, could I please ask investors not to close this session as we'll now redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the company can really better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of BBI, BBGI Global Infrastructure, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. So good afternoon to you all.